Hi, I'm Jess, part-time Hobbit, and I'm here to talk to you about Tolkien. There are about a hundred different recipes that pop up when you Google Lembus bread, and that's for a good reason. It's one of the most recognizable foods in fantasy, and if you've ever participated in a Lord of the Rings marathon, you've undoubtedly tried some. However, did any of that Lembus bread truly sustain you for the whole day with just one bite, while tasting like it came from the hands of the gods themselves? I doubt it. Well, my beleaguered rings fans, I have a treat for you today. Because this recipe... Also, it doesn't match those requirements because I, I'm pretty sure it's impossible. I have made my own recipe though, following the book's parameters as closely as possible, and I can't wait to share it with you and then talk about why Lembus bread is so cool. Without any further ado, let's get into it. The food was mostly in the form of very thin cakes made of a meal that was baked a light brown on the outside and inside was the color of cream. We call it Lembus bread, and it is more strengthening than any food made by men, and it is more pleasant than cram by all accounts. Tolkien's Lembus bread is largely inspired by hardtack or cram, which have been traveling staples for generations. Hardtack consists mostly of water and flour, plus a little salt if you're lucky, and it's baked multiple times until all of the moisture is leached out. This makes it hard enough to break teeth and blander than a saltine, but it kept the maggots in Molded Bay. For a while, anyway. Luckily, Lembus bread has a hint of elven magic that elevates it far above cram. If you'd like to make this recipe yourself, it's in the comments down below, but the measurements will also appear on screen. Since I'm not trying to break any more teeth today, this recipe is going to be based off of shortbread rather than cram. We're going to begin by creaming together butter and sugar. I'm fairly certain that Galadriel didn't use an electric mixer when she was making this for the Fellowship, but I also don't think I'll live to see 8,000 years, so I'm gonna cut myself some slack and use one anyway. The taste of Lembus bread isn't specified, but Gimli does compare them to the honey cakes at Bayorn's house, so we're going to take that as inspiration and use honey as our primary sweetener. Stream in the honey and beat well. Next, we're going to mix in vanilla and salt. For a basic flavor, you can stop adding things there, but I like to include some lovely winter spices. Here, I'm using cinnamon, nutmeg, and ginger. Another great option is lemon zest if you'd like a lighter flavor. Let me know in the comments if there are any other flavors you think would work here. And, uh, make sure you keep an eye on your cables. <laughs> Once that's combined, we're going to add our dry ingredients, flour and blanched almond flour. Almond flour is much more filling than wheat flour, and it's rich in vitamins, healthy fat, and fiber. While this won't quite turn our Lembus bread into a superfood, I think it's a nice nod to Tolkien's magically sustaining creation. This may seem a bit dry, but as long as it can press together a bit like wet sand, you should be good to go. Shape the dough between two sheets of parchment paper, rolling it out nice and thin, about a quarter of an inch. My table is too flimsy for this and I had to take it somewhere else to roll, so make sure you have a sturdy work surface. Once it's rolled out, take off the top layer of parchment paper, and I'm going to divide this into roughly three inch squares with a sharp knife. These leftover edge bits could be rolled out and shaped into more Lembus bread, but I prefer to just make cookies out of them, like so. Next, using a sharp razor or knife, cut the parchment paper between the Lembus bread. Then, leaving the parchment paper on the back, spread them out on a 9 by 13 inch baking tray. After a 10 minute cool down in the fridge, I'm going to use a silicone spatula to clean up the edges and smooth them out. 
Now I'm going to score the lemba spread with our knife, trying to cut about halfway through the biscuit, but not all the way. This isn't a detail from the books, but it brings it a little closer to the movie version, so I think it's a nice touch. These are going to go straight into a 325 degree oven for about 13 minutes until they're light brown on top. Now that our lemba spread is cooled, let's check it out. As you can see, you end up with a nice thin biscuit that snaps beautifully. Light brown on the outside and the color of cream on the inside. The honey and the cinnamon come through just enough, and although it's a little bit dry, that just means that it goes perfectly with a nice cup of tea. Now, admittedly, this won't be enough to keep me going for a whole day, but I think it can sustain me while we talk about the origins and significance of Lemba Spread. Lemba Spread was first created in Middle-earth by Yavanna, the godlike Ainur responsible for all good growing things in Arda. Following the War of Powers, in which the Valar fought to free the first elves from the evil Morgoth's influence, the Valar guided the elves from Quivenen, where they had first woken, to safety in Valinor with the Ainur. This passage was known as the Great Journey, and Yavanna made Lemba's bread to ensure that the elves would be sustained while traveling. Throughout most of the First Age, Lemba's bread was kept as something secret and sacred, a recipe that was passed down through the hands of elven queens. This tradition was broken when Melian, the elven queen, gave the human warriors Beleg and Turin Lembus bread. From that point forward, Lembus bread was only offered to men very sparingly, so when Galadriel gifted it to the Fellowship towards the end of the Third Age, it was an act of special historic significance. Without Galadriel's foresight and, and trust in the importance of their quest, it's unlikely that any of the members of the Fellowship would have been able to complete their task. Now that we've taken a look at the history of Lemba spread within Middle-earth, let's take a look at how it links into the world of Tolkien. If you look into his personal writings, it isn't difficult to make connections between Tolkien's world and Lemba spread. Tolkien was an incredibly devout Catholic who stated that he had a deep dedication and love for the Eucharist. The Eucharist, also known as Communion, is the Christian, and more specifically Catholic and Orthodox belief, that during the service of the Mass, the bread and wine on the altar become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. The Eucharist is taken and eaten by practicing Catholics as a special source of grace that leads to a deeper communion with Jesus. Tolkien believed that receiving the Eucharist daily, if it was possible, was the best way for someone to remain strong in their faith. With this in mind, it's impossible to ignore the connections between the Divine Eucharist and the sacred bread of the gods that he included in his world. He even compares the two in letters, though he shied away from saying that it was a one-to-one -one allegory. Just as the Eucharist sustains and fulfills the believer through a special godly grace, so does Lembus bread fulfill the traveler. However, the connections don't end there. We can also look further back into the Judeo-Christian culture to the Exodus. After fleeing from slavery in Egypt, the Israelites, led by Moses, found themselves starving in the desert. When the Israelites begged God for help, God sent down flakes of bread-like food that was able to sustain them for their long journey to the Holy Land. We can draw clear parallels between this and the journey of the Eldar, the first elves, when they went to Valinor, where Yavanna's food sustained their strength. Outside of biblical comparison, we can also look to the pagan feast of Lamas Day. Lamas Day, also known as Lunasa, was celebrated by many pre-Christian polytheistic groups in Europe. Lamas Day means loaf mass, and it takes place in early August. It's traditionally the first day that grain could be gathered by farmers. Like many traditional harvest festivals, Lamas Day celebrates the summer's efforts and welcomes the beginning of autumn. The feast was an opportunity to celebrate and give thanks for the harvest and the security it would provide in winter months to come. Bread made from the grain that was harvested was at the center of many rituals and rites that were performed on Lamas Day. The bread was used as a symbol and sign of protection and strength. Lamas Day and its celebration certainly would have been at the forefront of Tolkien's mind, as a dedicated Catholic and a scholar immersed in early European culture. Indeed, in the first book of Lost Tales, we find a poem called Na Quelian, the Quenya word for autumn. The poem celebrates the close of summer and the coming of winter and mentions Lamas Day by name. 
In addition to inspiring the cultural significance of Lemba spread, the word Lamas likely helped inform the name. Once again, as in all of Tolkien's works, we see that none of his writing is allegorical in the one-to-one -one representation sense. Tolkien's creations are a masterful patchwork of all the things he studied, knew, and loved. He drew themes, legends, and tropes up from the cauldron of myth, and fitted them together into something that was entirely unique, whilst remaining deeply embedded in real culture and history. Tolkien himself admits that the invention of Lemba's bread was in part due to necessity. His story required the characters be able to travel great distances without frequent resupplies, and Tolkien needed a way to fill potential plot holes. But necessity is the mother of invention. The story requires Lemba spread, and so it came to be. However, due to the deep development of his world, which was rooted in both real and mythical history, Tolkien created a device that went far beyond mere necessity. Lemba spread both makes possible and enriches the tales told in Middle-earth. Thank you all for joining me this week. I hope you'll let me know your thoughts in the comments below so we can start a conversation. If any of you try this recipe, feel free to send some pictures to my Instagram, which will be linked down below. Subscribe if you'd like to hear about next week's subject, Tolkien's dragons and why they're so cool. I hope you enjoyed this week's discussion and that you all have a very happy hobbity day.